Hi, I'm George Norrie, and welcome to our Coast to Coast AM YouTube channel. Have fun, tell your friends, and share us with everyone. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and Coast to Coast AM's mobile app. And always remember to log on to our website at coasttocoastam.com for daily articles, the best paranormal information, and all you need to know about your favorite guests. And now you can become a Coast Insider directly through the Coast mobile app. We welcome our international listeners and even offer a free two-week trial. So don't delay. Become an insider today. Jordan Maxwell is a preeminent researcher, independent scholar in the field of occult religious philosophy. He served for three and a half years as the religion editor of Truth Seeker magazine, which is America's oldest free thought journal. His work on the subject of secret societies, both ancient and modern, and their symbols has fascinated audiences around the world for decades. He has conducted dozens of seminars, hosted his own radio talk shows, appeared on more than 600 radio shows, and written, produced, and appeared in numerous television shows and documentaries. Much of his work is devoted to understanding ancient religions and their influence on world affairs. Hi, Jordan. How are you? Well, hello there, George. Always a pleasure. Delighted to be with you tonight. You have an extensive background in ancient mysteries and work. How did you get interested in this? You know, I don't even know. I just, as a child, I gravitated toward the, uh, for lack of a better term, the dark side of the world. (laughs) I always realized and felt in myself that there is a whole world of knowledge out there for me, but I just didn't know where to go to look for it because I just didn't buy, you know, what I see. I know there's more to life than what meets the eye. And so that's what really got me started as a child. And I uh, I grew up in, happily in a home where my parents, uh, um, especially my mother, continued to promote me to read books and study and question everything. And uh, I suppose it's just in my blood. I you know that- love the dark side. That, that, that happened to me in, in terms of not necessarily the dark side, but a family that really pushed me into reading books about the unknown and to go ahead and start doing my own homework and, and start investigating on my own. And at the age of 11, 12, 13 years old, I started doing that. I think that helped my journalistic background. Oh, a lot. without a doubt. You know, I, I started asking questions when I was like Know, eight, nine, ten years old, and the adults would look at me like I was, like I was uh, a fool. But a classic example of a of a child's question when I was being uh, uh, confirmed in the Catholic Church about nine, ten years old, whatever it was, mm-hmm. and we were told that the bishop would possibly ask uh, his the children after the service was over. Uh, if they had any questions, and that we were told not to ask any questions, period. Well, that night after the uh, the, the services were finished, uh, the bishop did ask, uh, are there any questions from the children? And I stood up, scared to death, of course, because I knew I wasn't supposed to. <laughs> <laughs> and I asked the bishop, I said, my father works with uh, torches. I mean, he's a welder. Um, could I take a torch and burn an angel. Would it hurt him if there was an angel here and I hit him with the torch? And uh, and nobody said anything for a few moments, and then he said, well, of course not. And I said, why not? And he said, well, because you can't burn an angel. I mean, uh, fire is a natural thing. It takes a wood and, or paper or something to burn, but you can't burn an angel. And I said, why can't you burn an angel? And he said, well, because angels are spirits, and you can't burn a spirit. So I said, why am I worried about going to hell when my spirit will burn if you can't burn a spirit? And it was quiet all over the church, and I knew from that moment on um, there's more to the story than meets the eye on everything. Absolutely. What a great question for an eight- or nine-year-old to ask. Well, oh, I'm just gosh. looking at the uh, the words and putting the words together, and and that's uh, what I've been doing all my life. You know, when you talk about your interest in the dark side, explain what that means. Yes, I do not mean that I am I am interested in the dark side to learn from it. I am interested to learn about it, meaning that there is always <clears throat> more to the story, as I said, that meets the eye on everything, and. Um, a classic example, if you're going to build on, on a foundation, say on a second floor 
and you're going to put a lot of weight, like printing presses or whatever, the smart thing to do before you go starting to build on that foundation is to go downstairs, get on a ladder, and go through the ceiling tiles and look at the foundation of the floor. Look at the beams to see if the floor is going to hold that kind of mm. weight. <laughs> so what you're doing now is you are standing under the foundation to get understanding because that's where the word understand comes from, to go under the foundation to see what it's really based on. Good point, Jordan. A few years ago uh, in Kansas City, Missouri, at the Hyatt, uh, they had a collapse of a uh, corridor Oh yeah. In, uh, because they just had too many people standing on it. And I would guess their architectural studies, they did not factor in <laughs> a total amount of people that would be able to walk there on any given time. That's and right. it collapsed, and it's exactly what you say. If you don't build that foundation first, the whole thing collapses. That's exactly right. I mean, if you're going to ship a pack package, for instance, uh, a big package, and you go out in the garage and you find some rope, and you tie the package up, well, the rope is probably going to be fine for the, for the shipping. But if you're going to take that same rope and hang it off of a 10-story building and put your life on it, and you're going to hang on it, now you better check the integrity of that rope. You better find <laughs> out if it's going to hold you, because... <clears throat> as long as your neck's not around it, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. Because your decisions in life are only as good as your information. And this is what has bothered me from, you know, from as far back as I can remember, that there are always two kinds of facts, the kind you look up and the kind you make up. And too many people get in trouble. Then their lives are filled with trouble because they just haven't done their homework. They have been told by other people, and this is something I really don't like, is when other people, the word is project, when other people project on you what it is, what it is that they want you to believe. Um, that is absolutely destructive to any person's uh, development. Um, you never know. You might have a small child who's a genius, who's questioning everything and, and might do something very big in life. But if you continue to put the child down and tell him not to ask questions, I mean... Uh, who was it? It was uh, uh, the, the, I'm trying to remember his name, one of the scientists said that when he was uh, a child, he used to ask the teacher, why is it we children have to answer your questions, but you don't have to answer ours? <laughs> you know? So my point being... He was a that, smart Alex scientist, yeah. huh? <laughs> but, uh, you know, I'll, <clears throat> always keep in mind, uh, as I have always, I like this one question, quote I heard many years ago. It says, always trust a person looking for the truth. Don't ever trust the one who's found it. The point being is that there is so much more to life than what we know, so many more facts that we're not privy to know. And even when you've got everything nailed down and all in a line, and then you find out 10 years later that all, all the facts were wrong, and now you start all over again, because this is a continuing process you cannot look at the uh, the monolithic structures of the world all over the earth and not know that there were profoundly brilliant people uh, far, far back in time. And unfortunately, our religious and political establishment have uh, <clears throat> marginalized all of those things. And it's only until, like myself, you go to Egypt and go into the pyramids and go into the temples, do you really begin to appreciate the profoundness of these ancient people and what they were doing? Why do you think they marginalized this? I mean, what do they have to gain by doing that? Well, I think that its bottom line is control. And uh, you naturally, uh, <clears throat> if you want to control people, you must control what they know. Uh, you know, you don't want to have to run for you don't want to run for mayor in a town filled with profound geniuses. And, uh, <laughs> they don't need you, right? Superior people. Uh, you know, the more you can keep them occupied watching uh, basketball, the better off everybody's going to be. And so, I think that the religious system, especially the religious system, uh, and I am I have nothing against spirituality at all. I'm talking about the corporate uh, religious systems that came out of Europe. Uh, we're talking about 2,000 years or 1,600 years at least of uh, the church dominating Europe and the Europe, of course, dominating the world. 
and there is a um, an agenda which has been outlined uh, thousands of years ago. And well, it's still in operation today. With this agenda and with the, as you talked about, some of the incredible buildings that were left behind yeah. years ago, do you think they were made by societies who developed their own technology, or do you think they had some help from someone up there? I think they had help from somebody out there. That's just my subjective opinion, but I, I my gut feeling is, uh, as brilliant as this creature we call man is, and it is an incredible creation, uh, we humans, but I don't think that we have the ability to do all the things that were done. Uh, there's, there's no doubt in my mind that we are not alone in the universe, and it always, it's always, George, amazed me to hear scientists and astronomers um, philosophizing in fields that they are not uh, prepared to talk about, but they talk about the fact that we obviously know that there's life out there, but they could never get here because the vast the distances of space are just too much. I think how absolutely ludicrous that is for an intelligent person to make a statement like that, when the fact is you don't know how far along these people or these uh, entities have progressed. You don't know what their evolution is. They, they've been around for hundreds and hundreds of millions of years. I mean, these scientists are making reference based on the technology they understand today. Well, of course, yeah. but we, we were told that a man's body could not go to more, what was it, 25 miles an hour back in 1920s? Mm -hmm. We were told you couldn't go any more than that. Uh, uh, you know, 25 miles an hour, uh, the human body could not stand. Well, so much for that wisdom. And as I said, <laughs> things just keep changing. The more the more we change, the more we stay the same. You have, uh, 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 ufology has also been a part of your entire big history time. now, hasn't it? Yes, very, very big. I have always been interested. I was born and raised in Pensacola, Florida, and, and right across the bay from me was, um, was Gulf Breeze. Yeah, oh, that's right. And I grew up in Pensacola myself, and I don't know why me, but I grew up having all kinds of other world experiences. Uh, I mean, there's, there's very difficult to try and explain it, but my whole life was filled with, uh, with strange things happening, seeing strange things that other people didn't see or having experiences uh, that other people couldn't relate to. And so I am totally sure there is something very legitimate going on in that area of Pensacola. Did you get going in your career? Did the, did the Barney and Betty Hill case get you going as it did me? No, I, I really wasn't very well aware of that one. But my own personal experiences of what got me going. I mean, as a child, I would wake up. I, I put my bed purposely by my window so I could look up at the moon and the stars at night. <laughs> and, I would, and I'd lay there at night looking and thinking about what might be out there in space. And then I'd fall asleep, and I'm talking about 10, 12 years old. Yeah. And then I would wake up in the middle of the night, and, and I would see uh, someone at my window. Right, and I'm, my head's right there at the window. And they would be there looking at me. And, and when I'd wake up, I'd see them, but they would move instantly. But I saw them, but they would move. And I quickly, as a kid, you'd move very quick. I pop open the screen, and the, the yard is lit by the moon. There's no one there. But you're convinced someone was. Oh, yeah. I saw them. Yeah. So, and then, of course, I had, uh, I had some extraordinary experiences with spirit entities coming into my, into my bedroom. I, I woke up one night, maybe 9, 10 years old. I woke up one night absolutely uh, screaming my head off. I was totally ballistic. I was crying and yelling. Uh, because I knew that there was an entity in my bedroom, and it was extremely evil, and I knew it. And, and my mother, of course, screaming at that hour in the morning, 2 in the morning, everyone in the, in the neighborhood was hearing it. And um, my dad and mom kept trying to come into my room, but I was screaming and jumping up and down the bed crying, don't come in the room, he's here. You were trying to protect them? I was trying to protect them, and that's all I remember, is I wanted to my protect gosh. them from the entity that was in my room. And he finally, it finally went through the wall, and I felt him. I saw, I, I didn't see anything, but I felt the entity leave the room, and I knew where he left. I pointed to the wall, I said, he's just left. And, and I, then I fell on the bed, and I was totally exhausted. 
Um, so I've had these kind of experiences quite literally all of my life. So I am totally, positively sure that we are more than what we think we are. We there, There's more to the human race than what meets the eye. No question about it. Jordan, do you believe that that entity when you were a child was the boogeyman that so many children have reported seeing? Well, I wouldn't be a bit surprised. Uh, this was not... <clears throat> My experience was not with something that was a, a scary boogeyman. This was a very, very frightening experience. This uh, was worse than that, then? It was far worse than that. I was totally ballistic. I was screaming my head off, and I was frightened to death. I, I could not see what the entity looked like, but it was there. And, and a child that age does not go totally off the charts uh, that, that bad for no reason. And, and when it left, I felt it go out of the room. And uh, so as far as I'm, and I, that was, as I said, that was not the only experience, but that was one I will never forget. And we talked a little bit about uh, the UFO. Yeah. Two points I would like to make. First of all, i preface that by saying <clears throat> that I've done a lot of radio over the years myself. I've had my own radio show and been interviewed by many people. But you are an excellent host. I am very happy to be uh, on the show and talking with you because it's such a pleasure to talk with you. Oh, thanks. And um, in relation to the UFO, I've, I've been asked if you believe in UFOs. No, I don't believe in UFOs. I don't have to. I know they're here. And I have to tell you a quick story that happened to Ivy, Ivy West, who you know. Yes. And myself and Paul Tice, who you'll have to know All later. Right. Uh, I was, uh, this was back in 92, back in 1992, I was going to uh, be a, the best man at my friend's wedding up in Palmdale, which is about uh, 60 miles north of me. And I went up there to spend the day with him, and as we, everyone was getting ready for the wedding, uh, his, uh, his wife-to-be went out with her mother and girlfriends to the market, and they came back, and there was an old man following them in the car, and he got out and followed them up to the house. And we wonder who is this? And he came up, and the, and the girl said to me, she said, we met this man in the market, and he said he needs to talk to the uh, best man at my wedding. And she said, how do you know I'm getting married? He said, I just need to talk to the best man. And so she let him follow her home because he was an old man and didn't look uh, very dangerous. Suspicious, yeah. yeah. And so uh, I said, well, okay, talk to me. And he said, I, uh, I just have been told to tell you that you're going to be in a car, and you're going to be driving the car yourself, and there's going to be a lady in the front seat and a man in the back seat, and you're going to be way out in the desert, and you're going to have a tremendous UFO confrontation, but it will not happen for at least a year and a half. It's going to be a year and a half from now. And I said, well, sometimes my friend uh, and I go up to, uh, you know, to the desert at night, looking to see what we might see. And he said, no, no, this is going to be way out in the desert, and it's going to be east of California, and they are going to pick the time for you to see them. And so he said, but remember, a year and a half from now, and you'll be driving. Well, a year and a half from then, I was speaking at a conference, a UFO conference over in Mesquite, Nevada. And on the way back on Sunday, I had, I had Ivy in the front seat and Paul in the back seat. And we were talking, and I said, have you ever been up to Area 51? Well, no, none of us had. So I, we turned around and decided to go up. And we get up there, and we're sitting and talking with Joe and Pat Travis, uh, the lovely people who own the little alien up in Rachel, Nevada. Yes. And so we're sitting up there, and then when they're closing uh, that night, about 11 o'clock, 11.30, I said, Joe, where do we go to see UFOs? And he said, go out in the parking lot, they'll find you. And uh, but and so Pat says, well, if you want to go where all the tourists go, you go out on, on the highway and go back south toward Las Vegas, toward Vegas, back south, and go exactly 20 miles. And you'll see a big, big mailbox there. That's the famous black mailbox. And just sit there and wait and see what will happen. So we got in the car, and as we're driving out, Ivy's in the front seat. Paul's in the back. I'm driving. I got onto the highway and turned left, going north. Ivy didn't catch it. I didn't, or Paul. We went 20 miles north 
of alien rather than south. And when we got to the 20-mile mark, we slowed down, put on the bright lights, looking for a mailbox, couldn't find one. So we decided to turn around and go back to the alien. Mm -hmm. Well, as we stopped the car, right where we stopped the car, there was a a road leading off out into the desert, a well-kept level road. And Ivy and Paul said, let's go out in the desert. And I said, well, you're out in the desert. You don't have to go any further. (laughs) Yeah, I don't want to go any further. (laughs) I don't want to go any further (laughs) into the desert. And it was totally overcast from sea to sea, totally overcast. Couldn't see a thing. And they wouldn't stop. They said, let's go out. So I did. We drove out a couple, three blocks, and then all of a sudden I felt very strongly that we have done something wrong. I knew that we were in a wrong place at the wrong time. I backed the car up to turn it around, and I said, Ivy, I'm getting out of here. I'm scared. There's something wrong, and I don't know what it is, but I'm trusting my gut feeling. And Ivy and Paul jumped on me and said, look it, park the car. We get out for a couple of minutes. So I said, all right, but I don't feel good about this. They said, park the car, get out for a couple of minutes. So I did. We could not have been out of the car more than one minute when the clouds just north of us, and remember, it's very dark on the desert at that hour, like about 1.30 in the morning, when it's totally overcast, no light, period. And just north of us, the cloud began to open up a hole in the cloud, and two beautiful, bluish-white, glowing, uh, disc-shaped things oh came floating in, not zipping by, but slowly floating through the hole, coming. And as they came through the opening of the clouds, they leveled off so that their light reflected off of the clouds above them. And each one of them appeared about the size that the moon appears, the full moon Mm -hmm. appears in the sky. So they were not little dots of light. These were beautiful, about the size of the moon, gorgeous, glowing blue and white uh, disc. As we, we, we were shocked when we saw these two discs come through, five more followed them. Now there were seven bluish white discs hovering above us, making no sound whatsoever, and scaring, my, and scaring me to death. Ivy and Paul are jumping around like they've seen Santa Claus for the first <laughs> time. They loved it. I was scared because I knew I have never seen anything like this. I, I'm from Pensacola. I know what the Naval Air Station has. Yeah, exactly. I've seen all the, the top-of-the-line stuff. But this was not anything I have ever seen. And I was legitimately frightened. And I told Ivy, I said, we're getting out of here, Ivy. I don't know what this means. I don't know who they are, and I'm scared. I want to get out of here. And so Ivy and Paul jumped in the car because they knew I was serious. They rolled the window down. I put my foot to the floor, flipped on the lights, and took off. When I did, immediately Ivy and Paul went totally ballistic, now themselves screaming at each other, and now they're scared big time. What are they scared about? And that's and I, and I kept screaming at Ivy because I am frightened. Ivy is now screaming, a woman screaming in your ear while you're driving fast. It's an extraordinary adventure. And so <laughs> been, I, been there, done that. <laughs> yeah. And I, so I screamed at Ivy. I yelled at her. I said, Ivy, shut up. I'm trying to get out of here. And she's screaming. And so I stopped the car quickly and threw open the door, and the, those seven disc-shaped things were now down on us. Oh, they my were huge. Gosh. And they were zipping around around the, uh, the car. They were doing extraordinary things of uh, coming together in a circle, blowing out into a seven-pointed star, coming back into a circle, blowing back out into a seven-pointed star, doing all kinds of extraordinary stuff. And it was, it, they weren't hurting us. They were frightening me. And now they've got the attention of Paul and Ivy, and they're scared. We got back out on the highway, and we stood there, and all the emotions started pouring out. There were tears. There were laughing. It was, it was beautiful. It was frightening. It was this and that. We went back to the motel, and for about an hour, you can imagine, the, 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 the conversation was, what in the world did we see tonight? made no sound whatsoever and did things that we have never seen any any craft do. And later the next morning I got up and Ivy and Paul were over at the little alien having breakfast and 
I went over and I, I saw a bunch of people sitting around the table listening to Ivy and Paul, and I thought they were talking about what, you know, they were telling the people what happened yeah. to us last night. No, no, they were telling the people what happened to them in the bedroom last night that I slept through. And Paul and Ivy were visited, or they let me sleep through it, obviously, but Paul was visited in the bedroom at the Lily Inn, and so was Ivy. One of these days you'll have to ask Ivy to tell you the story. It was an extraordinary story. That's, uh, and, and how does that tie in then to the old man who sent you on that merry way yeah. a year and a half before that? I know. Uh, he told me I would be in a desert, way out in the desert. He told me that there would be a, a woman and a man. And incidentally, he told me, and I asked him why, why uh, specific. And he said, there has to be a woman and a man because there's going to it needs to be two witnesses mm -hmm. to uh, to what you're going to see because the event is not for them it is for you but they want a man and a woman to be a witness to what you're going to see and there's a there's a lot more to that story because it continued on once we got back to Los Angeles and I went back to San Diego and that's even a, a, an incredible follow up on the story we'll talk about another time but nonetheless I'm telling you this because I have personally seen some extraordinary and beautiful things that we refer to as UFOs. They made no sound whatsoever. They were right down over our car. They moved with a precision that I have never seen anything move with. They would stop, change places, and just stop and lock themselves in the air and not move, then zip, zip, and moving around again. Uh, man, what an experience. Jordan, as you think about it now, do you think you had anything to worry about? Well, no, because uh, I, I, well, part of the experience is I went back out there, and I, and I parked, uh, uh, it's a whole story, and I don't want to go into it, but I realized that if they, if they meant us harm, we wouldn't be talking about You wouldn't be here, about it. exactly. Yeah. So I know that it was some kind of a contact, and obviously the man a year and a half before had been given that to tell me. And What a sight. Yeah. What a sight. What an experience. Too bad you didn't have the old camera and video camera know, with you. I know, but you know what? I don't think those things would happen if you if did. you had, because I think they're a lot smarter than that. <laughs> I think they tap into your mind. No doubt in my mind about that. Yeah, and I think that they know, they decide a lot of things. They will decide where they will meet you. They will decide what you will be doing and what you will have with you and what, you know, we've got to assume that these beings, whoever they are, are far, far superior to our intellect. I mean, they're like uh, giants and, and uh, brilliant people looking at children at play. Have you theorized why here, Jordan? Say it again? Have you theorized why they're here? Uh, yeah, I've got my feelings about it, but it's just a subjective theory. But um, I think that there's a very good possibility that they have always been here, that this is their... Uh, their Earth, we probably are someone's experiment. Mm -hmm. And they have always been here. But they are far, far clever. I mean, it's, we do the same thing. You can have an ant colony on your desk in your office, and you're sitting and watching the ants uh, living their little lives and never realizing, looking through the glass, that, that there's a whole world out there watching you. Dropping a little food That's every right. once in a while. That's it. So I am I'm convinced from my own self that we not only have been visited, but we are living simultaneously with entities from other places, and I am totally sure of that. How, no has, doubt in my mind. how has that affected, then, Jordan, the perception of various religions since the beginning of time? Oh, yes, that's the subject I love, because once you get into the occult or hidden, and let me clarify the word occult, is a Latin word simply meaning hidden. And so much is hidden. And once you begin to see the paintings from the Middle Ages uh, and the, in the uh, temples and all of the ancient paintings, you begin to see UFOs and flying saucers everywhere. And, uh, and we're told there's nothing in Judaism or Christianity that in any way would conflict with the, with the idea of extraterrestrials. We talk about angels. The Bible, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, talk about sons of God. 
Well, the sons of God are totally different than angels. doesn't mean the same thing at all. That's and then true. There are, in the Old Testament, there's another entity called the Watchers. Well, this is in the Bible. This is, this is Judaism of the Bible. This is Christianity, talking about angels. And what's so fascinating, Jordan, is almost every culture talks about extraterrestrials in their own little way. Absolutely. No doubt about it. If you'll remember, Abraham, uh, we're told in Genesis 18 that Abraham is sitting uh, by his tent, and three men come walking up. And he goes out and bows down, prostrates himself before them, and bows down before them, and says, what is my Lord saying to his servant? And they said that, that they were on their way to somewhere else. And he said, the star, and the scripture in Gen, uh, Genesis 18 says that uh, Abraham um, begged them to stay for dinner, and he had Sarah fix dinner for them. They sat and ate, and then the two of them got up and said they had to go other business, but the third one stayed for a little while to talk with Abraham, and the Scripture says in the Bible, Genesis 18, that this was the Almighty God, the Creator Himself. And He sat with Abraham, had lunch, thanked Him, got up, and then left. Now in Genesis 19, the two uh, men that, uh, that He had entertained, we now find them in Sodom and Gomorrah, and now they're being called angels. And they go into Sodom and Gomorrah. They have supernatural powers. They, they cause blindness. Interesting, too. Sounds that, like radiation, doesn't it? Well, something. They had some kind of technology. And uh, what's interesting is that the homosexuals thought they were good-looking men. Now, the sons of God, as we know, uh, there's, there's, where is it in Genesis 6, where it said the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them all as wives. Well, the point being is that I can understand uh, handsome, good-looking men talking women into the bed, but I cannot see some hideous sun creature from another world uh, dazzling the females. So they must have been good-looking men. Well, this is what the Bible says in Genesis 1.28. It says that God created man in his own image, mm -hmm. after his own likeness. But let me ask you this. How many civilizations might be out there that are part of the same yeah goodness uh, I've heard uh, I've heard there's over 50 from government people who were in a position to know and uh, they've told me it's well over 50 uh, different ones that they know about and there have been a lot of other good researchers who are talking about the same thing but that's the ones we know about which kind of leads us into secret societies, Jordan, something yeah. I have always, like you've been interested in reptilians, I've been always interested in secret societies, and you've, you've done some work in that arena as well. Yeah. These societies go back since almost the beginning of mankind, don't they? Oh, without a doubt, absolutely. You can trace, this, uh, trace the concept of, of people coming together for, for their own just causes, and not all secret societies are evil, of course. And I need to preface my comments uh, here by saying I have never presented myself ever as being the world's foremost authority on anything. I'm too smart for that. I am painfully well <laughs> you know, aware just about of, how much I, yeah, of how much I don't know. So I'm not the world's foremost authority. But I've been looking at this, um, these kind of subjects for 43 years. And, yes, the secret societies are a very powerful influence on the world today. There are things going on in the world today, politically and religiously, that would shock the normal person hearing it. And you can begin to pick up on, uh, there, is a, there is a whole system of symbols and emblems and words and terms, catchphrases, uh, flags, national coats of arms, presidential seals, corporate logos. All of this is a message. All of these uh, different symbols are messages they're telling you something and uh, and symbols are very powerful and we even use things like if you you need some tape we'll say hand me the scotch tape well it may not be a scotch company but everybody thinks of it as scotch tape yes. well, because words and terms and and propaganda is continually bombarding us they, but they did a great marketing job same with uh, tissue paper you say get me a kleenex that's right it. exactly yep. and so Consequently, I'm saying that we, uh, in our world today, we have what is referred to as a consensus reality, the reality that we have all decided upon 
uh, for better or for worse, we've all decided is true. And so it's a consensus reality. Well, I am of the opinion that, no, there's a lot more going on here that they haven't told you. Um, why is it that all birds, fish, and animals on the prairie, why is it that birds and fish all immediately fly in a different direction together? What causes that phenomena? Uh, what causes people all of a sudden to grab onto something and everybody's doing it, the mm -hmm. hula hoop, you mm -hmm. know, and, uh, the rap music, all of a sudden, same with, all over Same the with earth. clothes. You know, you're out here in Los Angeles, and you see some woman buy a fad outfit, yeah. and, and they've all got it. That's the point. I and mean, it's it, overnight. Yeah. And I have young people around me tell me, "Oh, I hear some, I hear some noise on the on the on the on the radio," and they tell me, "Oh, this is the biggest group in the world." I mean, they're, they've made millions, and I'm thinking, I've never heard this stuff before. And they, how long they've been out? They've been out for three weeks. Well, how could they be that big? Well, they are. Well, let's talk about the motivation for secret societies, first yeah. of all, and without getting into specific names because you don't have proof over who they might of be. Course, of course. But you do have the ability to say what they might be, the kinds of people that are involved in these things, because I think it's bigger than governments. I think oh, yeah. it's bigger than elected officials. Um, and, you know, they're, the, they're the, uh, the puppet master of the puppets, and we're all the puppets here. Well, no doubt about that. What do they want, first of all, Jordan? They've got more money than God, don't they? Well, yes, and if they don't, they can always print it, you know. They've got printing presses. <laughs> <laughs> Legal printing presses, yeah, that's right? That's right, that's right. And, um, but I mean, what do they want? What's their motivation here? Well, again, I would uh, again. I have to preface it by saying it's just a subjective opinion of mine. But I think that these people, whom we would say are the puppet masters, are themselves puppets of a higher power. Oh, really? Yes, I am totally convinced for myself that the uh, some of the most. Uh, uh, Hidden, powerful people in the world are themselves, uh, uh, you know, in subjection to higher authorities. And, uh, and how, how high might these other authorities well, go? Well, now we're talking about is there something to this story of extraterrestrials inter, uh, intermingling with, uh, with the human family? Uh, uh -huh. As a matter of fact, I have to tell you this. I, I watched a, um, an hour television show a few years back uh, on UFOs on one of the channels, and in it, uh, Gordon Cooper, was uh, he had about two or three minutes here and there, probably about five minutes total out of mm -hmm. the whole hour, of Gordon Cooper making comments about his views on extraterrestrials right. and UFOs. And he spotted a few. Yeah. Yep. So I called the producer who I happen to know, and I asked him, I said, uh, how long was the interview? Because I know what they do. They'll, they'll, they'll tape you for two hours and use two minutes. Sure. And so I said, how long was that interview? And he said, oh, it's about an hour and a half at least. And I said, could you make me a copy of that whole interview? And he said, well, I'm not supposed to because it's... Um, You've got the it's, outtakes, you know, huh? Right. But I talked him into at least giving me a, a, a director's uh, cut so I could watch the whole interview. Well, what I am telling you is absolutely astounding. The things which, um, which Gordon Cooper, he's a national hero. Former an astronaut, astronaut to, to some people who may be 15 years old or 20, and they don't know who he was. Well, he was an astronaut, and he was, a very, he was one of the first guys out there on the cutting edge. One of the seven. That's right. And uh, he is a brilliant guy and very, very smart man, and he had to be to be a, a, an astronaut. Well, on this interview, uh, <clears throat> they had, like, I guess, three cameras shoot. And so when he was on camera and it was being interviewed by this young girl, uh, it, was a very, it was a very interesting interview. But what really got interesting is when it was off camera, when they would shut the cameras down and they were going to move the set around a little bit, one of the cameras kept rolling. And they they recorded the conversation between the the hostess and uh, Gordon Cooper off camera, mm -hmm. and that's where it was interesting. And she asked him, and I still have a copy of this thing right here in my office. She asked him, "What do you think about the idea of UFOs and extraterrestrials?" And he said, "I work with one. We have been working with him for some time. We found him in Mexico when he crashed." 
and our government went down and uh, and uh, cordoned off the area where he crashed. We nursed him back to health. He is now with us in uh, in uh, this country, and we've been working with him. And I've worked with him personally. So, oh, and I thought, God. wow, man, put that on the air. In the Old Testament, both in the book of Isaiah and once in the book of Psalms, the Messiah, not Jesus, but Messiah, in the Old Testament is referred to in a he- with a Hebrew word called uh, that is translated chief cornerstone. And so consequently, twice in the Old Testament, the Messiah is referred to as a chief cornerstone that the builders rejected. Then twice in the New Testament, uh, Jesus is referred to as the chief cornerstone. Well, the word in the Aramaic and Greek and in the Hebrew all means the same thing. It means a triangle point on top of a pyramid. That's what the Bible symbol of the Messiah is. A triangle perched on top of a pyramid in Hebrew is called chief cornerstone. And that's what is on and our And that's what money. it means. That's what it means on your money. That is the symbol of the Messiah of the Old Testament and the coming of uh, God's Son to rule the world and God's kingdom. And, uh, wow. Man. And they just leak it in like that, and nobody really knows it. Nobody even suspects. And I did a two hour uh, PowerPoint presentation up in San Francisco on that one subject. Two hours of documents. And, of course, it was laborious, and people got tired because I'm always being told, uh, you'd be surprised how many times I'm told when I'm through with a presentation, well, you didn't bring this out, you didn't bring that out, you could have talked about this or that. And I said, no, look at, we only got an hour, we only got two hours. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, you know, if, if this is all symbolism, Jordan, and nobody knows it, why'd they do it in the first place then? Who, well, because who? it's an in-house thing. Ah, it's, it's an in-house gesture. It's, it's for their own benefit. Yes, yeah. It's an in-house communication. And the secret societies, both in Europe and around the world, know that that symbol on the, on, on the back of the dollar bill, they know what it really means. They know that we don't, but they know what it actually means. Do they communicate with each other through symbols? Without a doubt. No doubts about that at all. They have certain emblems and symbols, and when the President of the United States speaks, uh, he's not talking to you. He's talking to other world leaders who know who he is mm-hmm. and what he represents. <laughs> so uh, uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful world of illusion, words and terms. And uh, you were talking about electricity at the, uh, at the break. Yeah. Uh, electricity, that's fascinating. Did you know that the planet Saturn was called L in the ancient uh, Phoenician system, which we call today uh, that a whole area of Israel, Lebanon, was called Phoenicia, and, um, and it's called the land of Cana, but the people were Phoenicians. And in that ancient culture, uh, they worshipped the planet Saturn. And consequently, Saturn in the old Phoenician system was called El, E-L. And consequently, if you still today worship the planet Saturn, you are called an elder you, because you got elected through an L election. Uh, now you are one of the L elites. And how did you get all of this? Well, you got the, the juice, the L electricity, the, the, the very powers of the universe, L. L is the planet Saturn. They make movies about him. Saturn was referred to as the uh, the Lord of the Rings. Of course, he's Lord of the Rings, and they're still making movies in Hollywood about Lord of the Rings. And this this symbolism stayed with us for thousands of years. Absolutely, no doubt about. It. The Greeks had it. The Romans had it. The Brit the British had it, and they gave it to us. And we're still running around using terms and words. We haven't got the faintest idea in the world. The Coast Mobile app is now available for download on iPhones and Android devices. You can become an insider directly through this app. This is a great option for our international listeners, and new users will also receive a free two-week trial.